Hey guys, Tommy, Modern Canine Solutions. I'm here with my buddy, Joe. Um, Joe is our personal real estate agent. He's huge into rescue. We want to bring him on the show to one, talk about his project that he has going on within real estate, but also just talk about rescue dogs and have a good time. So this is Joe. Hi guys. Um, yeah, I'm Joe Bryan with Spotted Dog Group at EXP Realty. Um, been in real estate now, going on nine years, I think. Going on nine years. Um, been in rescue. I was actually looking this up the other day, Tommy. So I started working with the rescue when I was a let in June <laughs> when I was 11. Wow. And so that makes it 34 years that we've been doing that. And it was because my mom didn't like, my mom had this thing about, you couldn't have a day where you didn't have something to do. Right. You had to have a plan. And so I played hockey, which took up like three days. I swam competitively, which took up every morning. <laughs> and then I didn't have anything to do Sundays. Right. So I started volunteering. We had worked with support dog. Do you know who support dogs was? Which so, one? Well, like the actual organization actual, called support yeah. dogs. So they were the first ones that. You're a little bit older than me. So it was yeah, a little before years. my time. <laughs> support dogs was the first people who were training dogs. Yeah for the handicap, not for okay. the blind, but for the handicap. And so, so service dogs, not CNI dogs. Exactly. Gotcha. And so they were an amazing organization, had some problems um, into the late nineties, but we used to volunteer with their like different events. So then we started working with, um, I started going to the St. Charles Humane Society. So it was like nine, 1990, um, was there a couple years. Then we had the 93 floods right. here in St. Louis um, that were pretty devastating. So. There weren't a lot of guys in rescue at that point. For sure. And so we would go sit at the bank and then whenever, um, I don't remember if it was the Army Corps or whatever, would say, okay, you can go in. Yeah. And we'd go, I mean, we would pull cats off of roofs. Um, it's the first time I ever got in trouble was because we pulled, we weren't allowed to save wildlife. So we had to save domesticated animals and livestock only. So, you know, we would pull, pull cows behind the boat. Yeah. Do they float? Yeah. Do they? Well, they can <laughs> swim. <laughs> So yeah, they stay up. Um, but yeah, you, cause you can't get them in the boat. So you right. just rope them and then pull them behind the boat. Right. Um, and you know what you would get them to the levee, then you would have to go another, you know, 200 yards to the next levee. Right. Um, but we rescued a fawn cause it was in the water. What right. Do, you do. And so we grabbed it, pulled it in the boat. And I remember they, they would check us to make sure that we weren't <laughs> rescuing wild animals. Showing and raccoons and waters and stuff. Hard plastic carrier this little pot and they're like okay i've got to cover over it I'm like oh that one's just sleeping and he's like that's not a dog <laughs> <laughs> that's <awesome. laughs> so um yeah we got in trouble for that one but yeah i mean i did that um all the way up i mean i was a vet tech in high school so i did right. my vet testing vet tech testing at 15 um was a vet tech all through high school um was still in rescue and then in the late nineties rescue got real weird. Um, especially early, even early two thousands where than what it is now. Yes. Weirder than what, it, because now it's pretty fractured, but the problem at that point was the change in definition. Okay. Right. So no kill had a very different meaning prior to like 1997. Right. Right. No kill meant no kill outside of major medical concern. Right. And it would have to be a very serious behavioral issue. For sure. Before they would ever destroy an animal. And the I don't know if it was the Humane Society. Somebody kind of changed their definition for that. And it became much more loose. And so you had a lot of people who were no-kill shelters that were destroying animals because they had a bite history. You know, or, um, I mean, cats would get destroyed just for age. Well, but I also feel like that was also the time frame when backyard breeders became way more prevalent and we started to see in an onslaught of dump dogs and, you know, just a lot more dogs in circulation. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, if you just look at even when I was a kid in the 80s, you know, maybe one in five houses had a dog. Yeah. Um, we actually just saw this with the uh, National Association of Realtors. When I started in real estate, they said... It was like 38% of homes had at least one pet. As of now, it's 63%. Yeah, something like two dogs per household now, statistically. Yeah, it, it's crazy the change. A lot of it a lot of it changed over COVID, right? Oh, for sure. Um, where a lot of people got animals. Um, I think 
you know, that was good because you got a lot of animals out of rescue. It's been bad, I think, on the back end. It's been great for A lot me. of people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what you did was you had a lot of people that got an animal because they're going to be home. Right. And then now I'm not home. And all the dogs have anxiety. We've coined it COVID dog syndrome. And, you know, it's... I mean, we're what, we're four years, three years past it, and we're still dealing with the repercussions of people that didn't do right by their dogs during COVID. Well, and you have this whole issue with a lot of purebred dogs becoming rescue. Yeah. Because I went out and I got my Frenchie or whatever it was, and now I'm not home, which to anybody that watches this, this is one of the biggest misconceptions people have. Your dog would prefer to be in a crate 12 hours while you're at work than it would be to be in rescue. Yeah, 100%. And a lot of people say that, oh, I don't have the t I don't have the time. I work. I'm gone for 12 hours. It's not going to hurt your dog. No. Your dog's used to that. Well, yeah. and they need 12 to 14 hours a day of sleep anyway. Yeah. And honestly, if your dog's not in a crate and he's just roaming the house, now this isn't this is a blanket generalized statement. Most dogs every little sound they hear, they're going to investigate. So they're not really getting their 12 to 14 hours of sleep they need anyway. And then we wonder why we have behavioral issues when we come home besides the dogs wanting to be with us. Because, I mean, I'm sorry, when I don't get my eight hours of sleep, I'm pretty freaking cranky. Yeah. You know, and so our dogs that are constantly on alert, constantly hearing things throughout the day, they're not getting enough rest. So yeah. that's part of it too. I, I think we've just seen, you know, I don't, rescues across the board. So, you know, we work, we, we built real estate pet project, which yep. is a group of 1500 real estate agents around the country who all help out in animal rescue. And the consensus has been this year compared to last year, almost 50% less dogs adoption. being taken in or, okay. So dogs adoption. out. Yeah. And I know with no time to spare, that's what Carol told me too. And I think it's kind of twofold, right? It's a lot of people got animals, which took a lot of people out of kind of the pool, yeah. right? Um, but you also just have so many coming in. Right. It, it's it's really scary that every rescue is basically in the country. You know, there's certain areas that do rescue a whole lot better. Yeah. Um, then, you know, Missouri, of course, we have the issue that, you know, we're kind of the puppy mill capital, you know, us, Southern Illinois. Um we kind of, we're always going to be full, right? But if you go up north, a lot of those rescues used to have open space. When you go north of um, really Iowa. Right, the freeze areas. Yeah, you yeah. had, because you have a, a shorter breeding time, mm. right? Well, and the ones that live outside die. Yeah, that's during right. the During the winter. Yeah, it, it's, I don't know what the fix is for that. I don't know if it's just time, right? Um as people get in new animals and that, um, I don't know what, I don't know what the fix is. I think, um, well, I think we need to do selective euthanasias. See, I, I have a hard time with that outside of the fact, uh, I think there are some animals that aren't able to be rehabilitated. Um, certainly some medical issues sure. that people try to put a lot into. The unfortunate part is, when people start selective euthanasia, it tends to be big dogs. It tends to be specific breed. Black dogs, you know, pit bulls. Right. And it's it's things that are beyond the animal's control. Right. Right. It's not anything the animal did. And um, I mean, is it a temporary salute or is it a temporary downfall for a long term solution? I, I don't know. Well I so hate to say that, but maybe <laughs> that is the law, you know if you could do it for a short time right. and get everybody kind of back. Go I don't know. I do think that um, rescues in general, not only do they need more funding, they need help, like physical help crewing to businesses. You know, well, we talk about this. Yeah. So I think going back to the way, like, if you look at Europe, they don't have this pandemic that we have with dogs. But I think part of that is the culture. Americans are very throwaway culture. Relationships, yeah. cars, our dogs, you know, if it doesn't fit in the time period, we just get rid of it. So I feel like we're going to be stuck with this, unfortunately, until our cultural mindset shifts. 
I think there's other pieces of that culture that need to shift too. The, um, the my dog needs to have a litter before I spay him. Because my dog's uh, cute, yeah. even though it's not going to bring uh, anything beneficial to the breed. But well, and you know the designer breeds. I'm not going to get too far off on a tangent, but <laughs> um, you know just the whole point of the designer breed, the idea that if I mix one um, cocker spaniel with one lab and do that with two of the same breed that are different animals that I'm going to get the same result. Right. It, it It's not. That's not, not how mixed breeding works. It's not how genetics work. So I, I think the, I think there's this idea that, oh, well, I'll just breed, you know, I'll have one litter. First off, having a litter of puppies is not easy. It's not it, cheap. It's not fun. No. It's, it's, <laughs> it is not fun. Um, I think people look at it from a different, from I don't know if it's the throwaway culture as much as it is the um, they see other people do it. Right. Right. It's the follow the Joneses type thing. For sure. You know, it's the reason that, you know, probably 70 percent of every realtor that has a dog has a Frenchie. Right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's because they're know. cute. And we get we all get Frenchies because, well, that's cause what our, everybody's client had. Right. right. We, so, um, and it, it, you know, Belgians after. Whatever the, the movies movie was. and you know. John Wick, Max, and the plethora of other movies that have highly trained Malinois in it. Yeah. I, I think you don't know with a mixed breed what the outcome in that animal is, yeah. right? I was yeah. watching a guy one day on TikTok that said, you know, if you don't want the energy of a Mal, but you don't want quite the size of a German Shepherd, maybe a Mal Shepherd would work. And I said, okay, well, you could get. The drive a shepherd, of both. <laughs> like right. a mal, or you could get a small, like you right. could get the exact opposite of what you're sure. looking for, or you could get all the bad sides of it all smashed into one dog. That's what I mean. You could because get the you exact have no opposite. idea. Yeah, I mean, you can get all the hip dysplasia, you know, DM, all that stuff that you get from a shepherd now in a Malinois, you know, and then if you breed that back in the Malinois lines, which as of right now, mals are fairly untouched by genetic disorders. It's going to change here soon, just like everything else does. As they overbreed. 100%. But yeah, just because you breed two good dogs doesn't mean you're going to get all good dogs. Right. You see it all the time. You'll get a litter of five dogs that are great and three that are shit shows, you know? And it's it, it just, yeah, when you start mixing breeds, it's not always a good thing. So corporate sponsors for rescues. Where's the benefit to the re to the rescue? Where's the benefit to the corporation? Well, a corporation, I mean, there's dozens of benefits. You know, what well, what we were talking about recently was, you know, I think every tradesman, if you run an electric company, a plumbing company, anything like that, donate services to the rescue. Yeah. Because what you're doing is you're creating 30 people that absolutely love you. Right. You're creating 30 salespeople. Right. Plus, you know, your rescues probably have more of a following on social media than you ever will. <laughs> oh, uh, absolutely. People want to see cute dogs. Yeah. Right. Um, so it's not free advertising, but it's pretty close. Well, and you can trade services. Right. Right. You know what we do? You know, we help No Time to Spare and Justin Bartlett down in Florida. Um, we help them social media. We help them with design. We help them with things that we're already good at. Right that then we can just say, hey, here, let us give you what we already know how to do. For sure. Um, I also think, you know, if you haven't seen how younger generations value social, um, I don't know what, what we're wanting to say, social um, responsibility, if you don't, like, that, that's what the younger generation appreciates in a business. Yeah. You know, there's two that are really good examples. Um, do you know Bombas is? Mm -mm. The sock company? Mm -mm. So if you've never had Bombas socks, Bombas, if you watch this, <laughs> awesome socks. Um, Sponsor the podcast. <laughs> but for every pair that they sell, they give away a pair Okay. to, I think it's homeless. I think they also do like other countries and things like that where it's yeah. needed. Um, they are the most comfortable socks, but they've grown to like number four. Like competing with Fruit of the Loon. Oh, wow. Who's been around since like 1880 or Right, something. forever. The other one that's a really good success story is Warby Parker, the eyeglass people. That are doing the little box or whatever. Yeah. you call And you just slide the, yeah. Because every pair that they sell, 
they give away a pair to people in need. And you've seen these companies grow in industries that nobody's touched. Right. Before Warby Parker, I want to say, I was reading this, um, there were only like four eyeglass companies that For really sure. made all the eyeglasses. Yeah. Like nobody broke into it in 60 years. Right. It's the younger generation appreciates that social responsibility that you being for something versus just simply for the business or against the right things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which let, let's be honest in today's society, far more people are against things. Right. Yep. I, I don't remember who it was. I think it was John F. Kennedy that said something to the effect that it's easier to get people on your, to hate something with you than to like something with you. Oh, I could totally see that. You know, uh, sure. it, it's kind of a, a weird psychological situation with yeah. people, right? We all like to, what's the, what's the saying? Company loves misery and misery loves company. Misery loves company. Yeah. So one person's in misery and they want everybody else to be in misery around them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Everybody likes to say, hey, don't you hate so-and-so? Right. Like, great. Now we have mutual terms. <laughs> <laughs> now we have something to, right. something to bitch about together. For sure. Well, so, you know, going back to the corporate thing with sponsoring, like we, res we work with like five rescues, right? So we work with No Time to Spare, which is a big, heavy one for us. Um, Serendipity German Shepherd Rescue, which is another big hitter for us. Um, Four Paws for Rescue, Five Acres, and oh, all, for Always and Forever in Kansas City. Right. So, you know, we donate time, training, resources. You know, we've gone out to Carol's Place, No Time to Spare, multiple times and given the entire staff and volunteers free multiple hour classes. You know, I've run through all of the dogs with the staff there. Like, hey, these are things you need to be working on. Or, hey, this dog's going to be a nut job. You know, be careful. This is how I would handle this dog moving forward. You know, and I know for a fact the staff and the volunteers truly appreciate us coming out and giving our professional opinion about what they're doing, how to do things. And honestly, since we moved back from Virginia, Carol has restructured a lot of things that they're doing based on conversations her, I, and Kayla have had which has been really cool to watch progress over the last couple of years. So, well, and I think a lot of people don't because what the rescues do isn't necessarily out in the open. Right. A lot of people don't see it. Yeah. You know, we, we hear a lot that, you know, I don't want to donate to a charity that doesn't use the majority of the money towards the cause. Rescue. Right. You don't have that in rescue. No, ever. No, they all donate almost everything even the big ones like best friends animal society um uh what's the one here stray rescue mm -hmm. even those big big organizations it's most of them are 80 85 percent there's yeah. very little that goes to salary yeah you know um and it's because they can they have so much volunteer help for sure right um but i think from a business standpoint you know it's certainly good for your image as a company. Yeah, absolutely. Right? To, to be able to say we support this, there's tons of tax benefits. Oh, yeah. So if the organization's a 501c3. Yes, make actually... sure they're a 501c3. <laughs> make sure uh, they're a legit rescue organization. Well, and I think people, and there are some of these that just are these little pop-up rescues and things like that, right? Um, that's, you can tell which ones oh, 100%. are legit. You can also... They're regulated by the Department of Agriculture. Here. Supposed to be, but if they don't know about them, then they can't regulate them. Well, and that's the thing. And that's the, so way, that's the same thing with the breeders. That. Right. That's the same thing with breeders. Yeah. Mm. Breeders is a whole different animal. You know, yeah. I think that, you know, I'm one of the few, I don't know if one of the few, but I'm one of the ones in rescue. I, I don't think breeding in, in and of itself is a bad thing. Well, I think, stop it. We're not going to have dogs anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be a while before we didn't have dogs. Right. But, um... I don't think breeding in and of itself is a bad thing. I'm never really for government regulation. Right. But I will say, I think there needs to be um, some sort of licensing around it. There is. Um, is there? You're supposed to. Yeah, nobody does. Maybe, so, is it only Missouri that nobody does? No, uh, so we do. So reputable breeders, they have to go through agriculture, they have to get licensed as a, as a breeding kennel, like all these different things. But if you're just Joe Bob on the side of the road that oops, my dog's had a litter. So that's the problem. It's not, it's not the, the responsible breeders that are right. doing their job correctly and that are following the rules. It's, as you said earlier, 
my puppy's cute. I want to get a litter out of them before I spay or neuter them. Or, yeah. Or you could also just have a lot of backyard breeders. A lot of people who... See the mother purpose, side of it. Yeah, purposefully. Um, were you around for Aiden, the burn dog? Or did you not come until right after that? He was in the kennel, I want to say, right when we got back... But I didn't get any interaction with it. It would have been before you guys left for Virginia. Was it before? Yeah. Cause it was because I remember I seeing started. I remember seeing the dog. Cause they've only had one bad bird dog. They had two. Did they? So we had uh we had Kenna, I think it was her name. Cause she was the first one. Okay. So I mean that situation was crazy. Yeah. There was somebody who went to buy a dog from this lady who was breeding, I don't even know what he was. He was like a Jack Russell something mixed. right who knows um the lady went to buy the dog and it's wrapped up and they open it and it's all burnt <laughs> and she's like well no. so she bought the dog anyway and took it to animal talk and said i don't know what to do but i couldn't leave it there right and then the next day maybe was when aiden came in same and, same litter, same place. Yeah, you, yeah. And so we, we assume. Uh, well, we knew. <laughs> yeah. Because they told us who they bought it from. Yeah, yeah. The situation was, you know, she had a little chicken coop out back that the dogs were in. Yeah. And she was using propane heaters. Oh. And the thing lit up fire. <laughs> and when we were talking to the fire department, is that's the second time that's happened. And so these people sold dogs that were burned. And then poor Aiden, you know, Aiden, then he came, he got all fixed up and then he jumped off the, the park bench and broke oh, his leg. I remember that. Yeah. <laughs> so I think he, he just had some bad luck. He's yeah. super cool now. Um, but like, that's what happens. Like, like that you, you have, and it's, it's more than I think we realize. I think also people think that when they have a litter, all the dogs necessarily get adopted. Hey. No, they don't. You know, it's harder for kittens. Yeah. It's harder with cats. That's why cat foster is so difficult to run because very seldom, if, if you have six kittens out of a litter, do all six get adopted. Right. For sure. You know, that's why it's hard. I know um, No Time to Spare has cut back a lot on, on the cat side because once you, like, if you decide you're going to foster cats, that's it. Right. You foster cats once. Because you're going to have one or two that don't get adopted. You're not going to take them to the rescue, right? <laughs> and they live forever. <laughs> right. So you lose your fosters a lot quicker. Right. Um, there's some cool organizations that do it a little differently, but um, I don't think people realize that, you know, oh, I'm going to have four pugs. Okay. You're going to have four pugs. One of them is going to be ugly and stupid. Aren't all? <laughs> they're so hey, ugly, they're cute. Ugly. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, one of them is going to be the one nobody wants. Correct. You know, and it, 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 it's in every breed, um, especially when I don't think people realize a dog having babies is not, I, I mean, how many times have we taken in animals with, with no time to spare that were in labor? Right. Multiple times. You know, that, that one golden retriever, what was her name? Holly. You know, and then you know, the rescue goes and spends 2500 bucks to get her safe, has the puppies. People never pay them back. Yeah. And we can't keep the animal. It's their animal. Right. You know, yeah. and that happens far too often. And when you look at rescues that are running on a sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year budget yeah. and volunteer only, yeah. to lose three grand, four grand, like, that's devastating. Well, and it's also, I mean... You can just watch the community groups, you know, somebody says, oh, I need to rehome my dog. Well, one, they get shamed because why are you getting rid of your dog? You don't know that person's life, you know, and but two, they'll say, oh, we'll just go take them to this rescue. They'll do all the vaccinations. Then you can get your dog back. Just adopt your dog back, you know, or whatever. It's yeah. like, you know, why, why even go that route? Like then you get, so then I see it all the time on community groups, like people are like, I want to get a dog. Okay, we'll go get it from rescue. And they'll be like, oh, well, the rescue has like a $300 adoption fee. I can't afford that. Then you can't afford the damn dog. <laughs> yeah, if you can't afford the adoption fee, you shouldn't ha have an animal. But I also think that, you know, and I talk to rescue folks about this, that 
well, I'm with everybody in the disgust of people who regularly get rid of their dog. Right. You get right. one, you get rid of it. You get another one, you get rid um, of it. I am very cautious about the shunning because the next step is people just stop asking. And then she start euthanizing their own dog. Euthanizing the dog. Right. Letting it go in the back, out the back. For sure. Whatever. Right. And so I think the rescue world, you know, everybody's very passionate yeah. about, about trying to help. We have to be very careful. 100%. That we're not ostracizing people without knowing the story. Well, because right? it's not about the people. It's about the dog. Right. So who cares what their problem is? Like, it's you, you should be caring about the dog. I got a client right now. We trained their dog sometime last year, and they live out in the country in, on, in Troy, and I guess their area is a huge dog dump area. They've got two dogs right now that got dumped on their property, and they're fostering them. They're rehabbing them. They're, you know come into group with them we just had them bring in the one the newest one because he was so matted they couldn't tell it was a boy or girl oh wow i mean it was horrible so they called us up like we don't know what to do we can't get into the vet because he's trying to bite everybody because he's matted like the mats were so bad that there was no gap between the skin and the mat like they were right. so, like it was so thick and we were like, just bring them in. We we have a full time groomer now. Like we'll figure it out. We'll yeah. figure it out. Let's just get this dog feeling better, and then we can get his vaccinations. Well, they ended up getting vaccinated anyway before they brought him in, which I'm sure Department of Agriculture would appreciate that. <laughs> but they brought him in, and I mean, he was a little wild child, but he settled in. And Molly, my groomer, and I, we went to town on this dog, and you know, I don't know if you've ever seen like sheep get sheep. Oh yeah where it just like, it just like folds off. That's what he was like, like his whole entire body. And he was only this big. I mean, he's 18 pounds. Um, and once we got to his face, like when we started finally cutting back his face, he snipped at us a couple of times and he was like, oh, you're trying to help. And he just like relaxed <laughs> and we got him all cleaned up. He was the cutest little thing. Um, but yeah, like, you know, now they went from having one dog and a couple of cats to having three dogs and a couple of cats. Right. You know, so. and dumping is a, a big problem, certainly in rural areas, but even, you know, I have my one friend that's the North County police officer. Yeah. I mean, we've taken four dogs from him. Yeah. And what he does is he'll see them wandering for days. Right. And then he'll call me like, Joe, can I pick up this dog? Yeah. And I call Carol. Hey, can we go? <laughs> can we, can I go pick this dog up? And bring right. It? That's how we got, uh, what was that dog's name? Meatball. He was Meatball. a cool dog. Or was it Buddy? No, Buddy came from floor or came from Spanish Lake. Okay. So those people, so it had to be me. Just I was one of the big ones. Hey, you got to message this guy, and Buddy was on his second owner, who was using him as a as a guard dog. Yeah, right. I mean, he had him just chained up in the backyard, and when I met Buddy, he was he was something, man. I mean, it's it takes a lot for me to like back from a dog. Get usually, <laughs> I can, well, usually I can I can work my way through it, but. Yeah, he screamed at me the whole way back until we stopped at Old Town Smokehouse. Once I started giving him brisket, he was good. <laughs> <laughs> to me all the time. The fastest way to a dog's heart is through his belly. Yeah, I mean, I stopped there to get food and uh, and Danielle came out and said, hey, I got two pounds of brisket for the dog. I'm like, this is perfect. I sat in the back of the truck <laughs> and fed him. That's awesome. And then it took me, Carol, and Dan, I think, to get that dog out of the car. Yeah, because he was, he was there when we first started with Carol. Yeah. So, and Buddy eventually became awesome. Became awesome. He lives with a single lady. Nice. In the country. Um, older lady. And there's a picture from whatever the Warren County newspaper, Warren County record, where the Girl Scouts came to the rescue mm -hmm. to volunteer. And there's a picture. Now, this is a dog that. He was I huge. Part of him was a little, he was misunderstood. Like he would grumble when people thought he was growling, but he was also pretty antagonizing. Like he really wanted to tell you he was scary. Yeah. I never saw him bite anybody, but he wanted you to know he could if he would. Yeah. And he was big and loud. And there's a picture of seven Girl Scouts <laughs> in his pen with him, not right. even playing in, in the yard, in his pen with him. And I mean, you realize when you move the, remove the animal from the environment, how quickly you can change. Oh, 100%. You know? And I think that's one of the things that most of the public doesn't see, too, is um, 
I actually had somebody call me just recently and said, you know, we found this dog down in the country when we were camping. Um, and he's been on our trail cam for a couple of days. He must've got attacked by coyotes. So we picked him up and we took him to the vet, got him cleaned up. And then what do we do? Like, should we, is there a rescue we can call? Went over the kind of the consensus, you know, rescues are full. Right. They're over in Maryland Heights said, you know, you can try stray rescue. You can try Randy's rescue ranch because he'll take in special needs cases a lot. Um, but you, you know, if we take them into rescue, you don't know what they're like. If he's really sweet now, right. You don't know six months in rescue, three weeks in rescue, right. How that can change. One you'll remember, what was that mal that we had? Storm, the one that I just named? Was it Storm or was it Ryder that was like totally calm when we got him? And then three months in the rescue was like, I just want to fight. So Storm was the monster, like the one that was like taller than me. Yeah, I'm thinking it was Ryder. Because that's who I met Carol through was because I Storm. Cause I saw her post and he was on top of the run, like, oh, like yeah. a bear on top of the run, <laughs> like growling. And... She was like, so this is what happens when you put a Malin wall in the wrong type of family. They end up dumped here. And he had bit multiple people and all that kind of stuff. And I just called her out of the blue. I'm like, hey, I own, you know, I think I was running Ridgeside at the time. I was like, I own Ridgeside Canine in St. Louis. You know, I'd like to train the dog for you for free to help get him rehomed. And I'll let her tell the stories. I think she's going to come on here next month. And she tells it way better than I do because her facial expressions with how that dog responded to me is hilarious. Uh, so Ryder was the normal size one that would destroy his face because of the storms. Oh yeah, no, I'm that was that was I'm her the storm then. Yeah, that was her. That was Carol's dog that she like. He used to go everywhere with us. So. Yeah, like that was her heart dog as a rescue dog that she couldn't bring into the house because the Rotties. Oh, yeah. Because, and we tried. Like, and they it just, just didn't like them. No, it just didn't work. So, um, because he came from, I want to say Forstell is how long she had him. Um, so he was already in the kennel when I met Carol. Um, great dog, knew all of his obedience. He had basically no teeth left because he kept bashing them on the kennels because of the storms. We adopted him out so many times. Do you know how I met Carol? No, I don't. Here you go. So I've always rescued animals, but I had been out of the rescue world for a while. When we started the real estate company, I knew that that's why we were going to do it. Like that, that's what we wanted to base the business around was helping the rescue world. And I put out a post on Facebook asking which rescue I should talk to, to support. It was World War Three, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you should talk to these people. Oh, those people stole my dog. Right. You know, oh, it was back and forth. And it was everybody just. Yeah. <sighs> and a lady that I was working with, Debbie, called me and said, look, there's a lady that I know that's got a rescue. They just um, moved to Warrington. And I think she's your type of people. I mean, she hit it spot just, on. <laughs> yeah. She goes, you should just go go meet with her and see if that's right. Yeah. And the first time I walked on the property, Carol and I sat on the back porch, and I think we were there for four hours. Yeah. You know, we had seen a lot of the same things from the 90s right. of what had happened. You know, you know, Carol left kind of that formal right. rescue situation because of... The drama and... the The drama and the... The rules. Right. Right. All the red tape. Um, which is, I think, why a lot of rescues also have a hard time growing is because they're afraid when they get into having a bigger board, there's going to be restriction. Yeah. For there's sure. going to be things put on that say, hey, you can't do this. And, you know, if Carol wants to go rescue a farm in March and make me swim in the pond in 40 for weather. ducks. Um, <laughs> she wants to be able to do it. She right. doesn't want somebody saying, Oh, we have too many animals right now. You know, um, or we have to get a permission to use the resources to go get these animals or whatever. Yeah. You, you don't, you, you need to be able to react fast. Yeah. Right. And I think a lot of people don't realize there, you know, there is, uh, there is some networking within the rescue groups. Yeah but not for what they need. Right. Right. So what rescues need to 
learn is from each other is events that work right marketing that works um educational content that works right that's what they really need to, yeah. be, to be networking that they they miss not they, just not just who needs this type of dog or work who has this type of dog for this person or i've got nine dogs and right. i need to know what to do with them. like when i had first met carol right after i met her they went down or right before maybe they had gone i think it was arkansas and this was back when they just had the like ford econoline van and there was four of them they went down i think they were supposed to pick up seven dogs or something and they came back with 27 see because it was a it was a breeder puppy mill situation um there were 50 something dogs down there i think the people contacting got five rescues to come and a couple didn't weren't able to show up. Right. And I think, I think the ones that did, they, they cherry picked. Yeah. Like all the little dogs or something like that. Well, and we see that a lot too, especially with newer rescues. We had that happen with, um, when we did the farm rescue with all the parents, mm -hmm. you know, there was, um, that came because an agent friend of mine was selling the property after the husband got control of it. Then. Right. And so, she, you know, she called me and she's like, you know, we have this rescue out here that offered to help, but she'll only take the puppies. Right. She doesn't want to take the adults or any of, you know, there ended up being 70 total animals. I think that we pulled from that farm. Yeah. Right. Cause there was, um, the two big 25 goats. ducks, 25 chickens, roughly Yeah. the s turkeys, six or seven turkeys. My nine year old daughter chasing a turkey was real nuts. <laughs> Uh, she caught it too. Nice. <laughs> um, the two big boar bucks, yeah, like the what are two hundred pound goats, right? Who were not happy. No. So do you know the, what we did wrong with those? Mm -mm. I know nothing about goats. So you know they they had been so mistaken care of that they had their hooves. Their hooves right. were all the way around. What we should have done was got them into the trailer and cut their hooves. What we did was cut their hooves. And then get them in the trailer. They're like, <laughs> freedom! <laughs> I remember getting them in the corner and me and Tony and Kevin and somebody else like cornered them. Right. And he's like, I can go through you and he just jumped in. <laughs> right. They're you know? big freaking goats. And they were gorgeous too. Yeah. Gorgeous animals. And then we had 18 Pyrenees. Right. You know, like, and what I had to explain to the agent, because she's like, you know, my friend will take the puppies, but you... They, the puppies is what pays for everything else. Right. And I think that's what, you know, puppy adoptions fund the majority of rescues. For sure. You know, and, and they allow them they, to Because they, they're so f in and out. Right. And they're easy to do. Pe people just want to adopt puppies. Yeah. Right? And and it's, I I don't think people see that. Like, that's what has to happen. Yeah. In order to fund the animals that stay there like OG who was there for three and a half right. years or, you know, shoot, Buddy was there for oh, wow. three years. Yeah. Something like that. Um, Stu, the guy I just got from the auto auction, he was only there like two and a half weeks and he was a pity. I'm like, what? <laughs> that dog was so covered when I picked him up that when you would touch his fur, it was like, um, like glue, like it would string. Gross. And it was... I guess somebody like because they had dumped him in the dumpster and I don't know if people didn't know he was there and were like right. throwing it was at the auto auction. So who knows? Was right. But when when Mita called me, she's like, well, he got out of the dumpster. So I think he got in. I'm like, he didn't get in. There's no way. There's right. no way he got this high into the dumpster. Right. But he probably was in it. And then as people threw stuff on, he was able to get high enough, you know. Um, but yeah, he took multiple dawn but i think it took four bass just to get the junk out of him he's right. a sweet dog but i mean we run into this you know in real estate it i get probably one call a week from either an agent saying hey can you help this person right um you know i think as agents too there's a lot of things that we can do helping with housing and helping to educate landlords right because i there's insurance out there now that people can get that protects not their pets from like medical, but the landlord from pet damage. Right. So if I'm a landlord, would I rather have a $200 pet deposit or would I rather have an insurance that I know is going to pay it? Right. So to me, that's a whole lot better 
route. You know, the same with the AKC canine Good citizen. citizen, you know, I think it's neat that some of the um, insurance companies have started to say, hey, this makes sense to take into account. Um, I think it shows a big change in mentality within the insurance industry. So I have a one of my part, not my partners, one of my buddies. He's an army vet. He's an insurance broker. He said they don't care anymore about it. Who's he with? Do you um, know? He's private. So. so he's got multiple. Yeah, yeah I'd have him check because different ones are different. And yeah. Into this, like, you know, there's some. So the way the. He says it doesn't really help with the actual policy. But what he says is like, if anything came up down the road, like you had to go to litigation for that's where it would help that uh gotcha yeah he says that the, the insurance companies they don't care anymore and it, they're, they're so hurt now i guess insurance is like taking massive hits over the last couple of years that their premiums they don't care anymore they're just jacking everybody up so. yeah i know um you know kind of the progression you know in the 70s they were banning dobermans mm -hmm. so that was the big thing you, gotta, you can't have dober right and then the 80s was German Shepherds. Right. Can't have German Shepherds or cop dogs. They're yep. going to kill everybody. Um, the 90s was Ratties. Yep. Um, which is, I think, why Carol has such an affinity for them. You know what I mean? It's like... Well, they're they dopey dogs. demonized right. at that point. They also, just like German Shepherds and Dobies, as Americans, we dumb down dogs. Mm -hmm. dog, dog breeds. We really do. So, you know, when the first German Shepherds came over, they were very much like mouths now. Oh, right? 100%. Um, we just dumbed down breeds for some reason. Um, it, and it's ever it. since then, it's been the pities, right? But the interesting part is there's some insurance carriers who never took away the Doberman. Right. So now you've just added, yeah. you know, and a lot of people don't know that that's part of their homeowner insurance policy, that if you don't declare that you have this animal, if your dog bites somebody, they won't cover Correct. it. Right. You know? And even if, they, even if you do do it and they accept your policy... One dog bite, oh, they're they're, they'll you. drop you. They'll <laughs> yeah. cover that dog bite because they have to, but they'll drop you. Well, and that's one of the things that, you know, we've had trouble with, with fosters. Like, who covers a dog bite of a foster dog? So I actually had this conversation with my buddy Chris, the insurance broker, and he said you can get a liability coverage specifically for your dog. Yeah, like an umbrella type. Yep. So if anything, anything happens, it'll come out of that versus your homeowner's. Yeah, I guess it's a writer or something. I forget what he called it. Um, it's not my realm. Um, but he said that that's the easiest way to save your homeowner's policy or your renter's policy if, you know, you use that instead. So, yeah, I think that I think insurance has to come around to the fact that 66 percent of or 63 percent of homes have animals. Yep. You know, um, I think, you know, there's there's still a lot of misconception about about breed in general yeah right um and i think we still have this idea that we can by banning a certain breed it makes them go away it's just like the drug <laughs> problem right if we right. ban drug, the drug it goes away way, right it's worked it's so not good for math works <laughs> or any any drug right. for that matter it's it's amazing that um we haven't come to the fact that that's not the solution for sure right what needs to happen is there needs to be um, a lot more push towards training. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it it shocks me how many people get an animal having never had a dog and then wonder why the dog's a shithead. Right. Like, your dog's a shithead because you don't know what you're doing. Well, look at their kids. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I almost think we should have licensing for having children and having dogs. So there's some states or some cities actually, and I think this is a really interesting concept that in order to get your rabies tag, your dog has to be spayed hmm. or neutered. If it's not, your rabies tag's like five times more expensive. Right. So it's cheaper to neuter your dog than to pay one year of that rabies right. tag. Now, for the breeders, they don't care. Right. Because the, it, it's part of you know what they're doing. Right. But for that's also just going to push people to not register their dogs. I don't, I don't know that it's, um, maybe, but I don't know that it does. I don't, I don't know that anybody who's not going to, because of that, it wouldn't just not do it in the first place. True. You know what I mean? Like there's always going to be people who go, I'm not vaccinating my dog. I mean, I vaccinate my dogs, but I've never actually paid for 
a city registration. Every time you do a, a, a rabies. Every time you do a rabies, really? it's registered. Yeah, the vet's offices do it. You don't have to do anything. Oh. Yeah, it's that always right? registered. That's why you get a little rabies tag. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. That, I never did. That's, I, I, if anybody watches this, that's a vet or a vet tech, correct me if I'm wrong. At least this is what it was in the 90s. The only vaccination that has to be given by is a vet rabies. is rabies. Correct. And that's why. Right. Because it has to be registered. Um, and they get, I mean, they, like every dose is numbered and all that yeah. kind of stuff. I just remember one time, I, w I don't remember where I was living. It might have been California. And maybe that's why it was that way. Um, you actually had to take the rabies certificate from the vet and go and I think it did used to be like that here okay. too, but now they send it in like in a batch. They all do it? Yeah, they all send it in in a batch. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's interesting to see how different places yeah. handle the situation. And just different, you know, with Real Estate Pet Project, just talking to different people. Like, the problem we always have here, pitties have a hard time, yeah. black dogs have a hard time, and in general... The bigger the dog, the, the harder. Right. And the older. You know, it's the, almost the exact opposite in Texas. Oh, yeah? Because they have so many chihuahuas. <laughs> it's the border crossers, man. I don't think anybody's bringing their chihuahua. On their <laughs> no, the, the chihuahuas <laughs> are looking for Taco Bell. <laughs> you know, but it's, it's interesting that, like, those shouldn't just be trading. You know, it's because in Texas, everybody wants big dogs. You know, you got livestock. You got right. things like that. You've got farms. You've got a lot of land. Um but yeah, it's the exact opposite. But then you have to orchestrate logistics and trading and moving dogs and stuff like that, transporters. I don't so know I why guess we couldn't jump. So, so I guess that's where the corporate sponsorship could come in. Well, and here's my idea. I use moving companies all the time. Mm -hmm. Hitch a ride with the moving company. Mm -hmm. Right? Get united. Somebody like that that says, you know what? If we've got extra space. You know, a lot of them are, air, as long as they're using air conditioned, whatever. I also think that there's a way, just like, what's your buddy that does the truckers for kids? You know what I'm talking? What's your buddy? Oh, Nino? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure how we, why we can't figure out a way to get truckers to transport dogs in their cab. A lot of truckers would love to have a companion. <laughs> yeah. You know, you could move animals much more easily. Yeah. If you if they could all jump in the you know, in the passenger seat. If you made a nice sort of carrier that could go in the passenger seat of a truck cab. <laughs> well, truckers, start it. <laughs> it's, it's, I will help you. Right. <laughs> um, I just think that it's you know, I think that there's there's just an opportunity there that isn't being used for anything else. Right. Right. It's not like you're giving up resources. Right. I mean you already gotta go there anyway. Yeah. So no. Yeah, that, and there is kind of I forgot what the program's called that's kind of like the um the underground railroad of rescue have you seen that mm -hmm. they like you know the, they'll put out i need somebody to drive from st louis to kansas city and you'll do that leg right and then somebody else does the next to do a handoff and yeah yeah we did that for somebody because i remember i picked them up in uh over by bass pro in st charles mm -hmm. and brought them out to columbia Okay. So that's all they needed to do. And then somebody's taking them from Columbia into northern Missouri. They're like red, red tick hounds. Oh, they are? Yeah. yeah. No. I know the dog. Yeah. I think that's what they were. Red tick hounds, something like that. I don't know. They were red and like hound dog. Yeah. Hound doggy. <laughs> <laughs> Big droopy ears. I used to know like every breed. Right. You know, I had this whole book on how every breed. Do you know how Dobermans came to be? What? Because there's like five different stories. No, there's one real story. <laughs> so the gentleman who started the breed of Doberman was a tax collector yeah. in Germany. And he would go to people's doors and they would run out the back. So he needed a dog that was big enough to, to intimidate and take somebody down. Right. Skinny enough to run through tenement houses mm. and fast enough to catch the people. <laughs> so he went, okay, and he started with... Um, it's weird that we call miniature pinchers miniature pinchers because they were around before yeah. before Dobermans were. But he started with German Shepherd and Roddy and then put in the min pin. To shrink them. To, to shrink them and make them thinner. Yeah. And that's where they came from. Isn't that crazy? Interesting. Because <laughs> I know they used them a lot during World War II and things like that 
as military working dogs. A lot of, they used to be really big in police work. I'm surprised they don't use them in police work. Is it, do you think it's because the breed's been so dumbed down in yeah. the States? So do they, they still use them in like sports. Eastern Russia and stuff like that, don't they? Not as much. So they're more, more confirmation. So more show dog. Um, here in the United States, we've ruined them. There's some on the working side of things, like on the sports side for like protection sports and things like that. There really is only one breeder, and I want to say he's like down in Tennessee. His 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 breeding kennel is like Benchmark Dobermans or something like that. Um, he's a senior decoy for PSA. He's a great guy. They've shrunk a lot since they've been here too, right? Like the Dobermans. Oh, they used to be massive. Shoulder mass. Yeah. Right? So like he's the only guy that I know right now that's breeding legit serious working line dogs here in the states overseas on the other hand they're monsters like i have a client that i trained years and years and years ago um he imported uh a red doby from russia and this dog now being five or six years maybe seven years old his head side to side no kidding is this big yeah he is huge like when he runs he looks like a horse <laughs> Like slap back line, everything. He is absolutely gorgeous, but he's a legit working dog. He hates other dogs. He hates most people. Like he's a he's a hard head dog. And I feel like AKC with the confirmation stuff, we've just seriously dumbed down and ruined a lot of the good working temperament breeds because we're looking for an image versus workability and temperament. Yeah, that's a good point. So I remember we rescued one. Somebody brought it in to get vaccinations when I was a vet tech and just never came to pick them back up. Yeah. And I, w I had a friend that I would always mess with his mom every time we'd get a rescue. Like, hey, she, I'm not taking a dog, Joe. I'm not taking. And we were all getting ready to graduate high school. And I go, hey, do you want a big, nasty dog? <laughs> and she's like, yeah. 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 <laughs> How are you sick? She goes, yeah, I want him. His name was Tyson. Yeah. I mean, and he wasn't huge, but right. he was... He was that Doby you saw every vein. Right. <laughs> he just, just solid. Oh, yeah. He was, a, he was the coolest dog. We also just butcher their ears. Butcher yeah. Ears. I mean, so the whole docking and cropping thing, if the dogs are doing their job, there's a reason for it. Yeah. If it, Yes. But, but if it's just a... Correct. If it's just a house pet, you're just looking for an image. And... Well, and I don't think... You know, a lot of vets stop doing ear uh -huh. cropping, right? And people think and it's that, been banned overseas. Well, I know people think that it's because of the cruelty of it. Mm -hmm. The true reason that the vets stopped doing it was because the amount of money they spent on aftercare. Oh yeah, right. So, so nobody's paying because their dog got an infection, right? And every dog gets an infection, hundred percent. I mean, it might not be everyone, but it's a it's very a lot. high. I mean, over fifty percent, yeah, sure. Um, tail docking is a little safer. It's a little less dangerous. Um, and I think in a lot of working breeds, herding breeds, things like that, you need that. Yeah. That's but, what I'm saying. Like, like if you're doing legit work stuff, like there's a reason for why they were doing it. But if it's just going to be a couch potato, I don't know. A good floppy ear Dobie is so adorable, <laughs> man. Like, it's just like, oh, um, you know, or like the presses and corsos. Like, they're so cute when they have their long ears. Oh, yeah. Just, Versus the tiny little, you know, cropped ones. I hate so, the little tiny crop. Yeah. Like, unless your dog's fighting, there's no reason for that. Well, so, pigs. Oh, yeah. You know, so they do it for so that. And pig baiting. Like, yep. So they do it for that. Um, sometimes, because ears bleed like a son yeah. of a gun. So, so like, even tracking hurting stuff or tracking, you know, there is, there is reasons to do it out there. But for probably more than 90% of dogs, it's not applicable. And bullies look so much better with their ears. Yeah. Bullies look so much better. Yeah. I don't like that. I don't like the mean looking dogs. Like Raider. Raider's a pointy ear dog. And he, if you, if you can imagine putting floppy ears on Raider, he looked just like a lab. Right. Or like, <laughs> or like, or like a freaking, uh, fruit bat. Yeah. I mean, if I would have clipped Boone's ear, you know, Boone's 110 pounds, his head this Right. Point. If I'd have clipped his ear, he'd look mean as hell. Oh, yeah. And nobody'd come near my house. Like, that's not what I want. Right, right. <laughs> I want everybody to think, you know, he's a he's a Pyrenees pit bull. He's right. 110 pounds of solid muscle. Right. Of sweetness. <laughs> Just a sweetheart. You know? 
he's funny because he's definitely got the Pyrenees. Yeah, definitely. He's he he walks the house every night, multiple times counts. Yeah, and you'll see if somebody's gone. Like I told you, Grandma's been in the hospital. Right, he's not like that. He kept walking the house. Like where's Grandma? Missing somebody. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it used to be seven. Now there's six. Something's wrong. Right. <laughs> so wrapping this up a little bit, like what what is spotted dog what is the pet you know pet real estate project and for people that are wanting to get in touch with you whether it's to buy a house or become part of the pet project like what do those different things look like so spotted dog group is our real estate team so there's um myself and my wife operate it here and then we also operate it in south florida with joanna um it's built around the rescue community and we do, we sell real estate so that we can go rescue. Right. You know, which I mean, we've bought two houses through you now. Yep. So when are we going to sell your other house? Do you ever rent it? It's going to go rental. Good. Good. I finally taught Kayla out of selling it. She's yeah. like, let's just get rid of it. I go, no. Yeah. So, well, you guys got a good deal on it. Yeah. You guys got it. And I think, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, we see that a lot. Like I have to move. And so I have to get rid of my animal. Yeah. Right. There are ways to buy, like, shoot, even the farm. Yeah. What did you bring to closing? Six grand, maybe? No, because we got some of it from the seller. Well, so I brought eight, but that was only because we had to make the difference in the VA loan. Oh, that's right. Because of because we the first house was on the VA loan, and we had enough left over, plus we had to put down, like, six grand, I think, to make the difference for the VA, what do they call it? Um, for your uh, VA eligibility. Eligibility, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. But other than that, they brought the repairs and even a portion of the closing. So, I mean, I think people think it's much harder to buy than it is. Yeah. And I think if we as agents could find ways for people to buy, there'd be less animals going in yeah. into rescue, right? Um, as far as Real Estate Pet Project, Real Estate Pet Project is a group of agents from all over the country who all help out in animal rescues in their areas or are are trying to. Yeah. So really anywhere in the country that you're buying, we have somebody that supports rescue yeah. that is also in that. Um, is there any benefit for the real estate agent becoming part of the pro- pet project? It, Other than just a community. community. Yeah. yeah, it's the community. You know, we also bring in a lot of, we do several, um, several meetings every month. So we do one a, one a month, that's an actual training with a, usually one of the real estate coaches that I work with. Yeah. Um, whether it's, we try to do every other month. So we try to do one month where it's real estate and one month where it's rescue, gotcha. where we all get together and we try to solve a problem. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, I think small business owners, one of the things that we take for granted is our ability to solve. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, you know, we've all been, how the hell am I going to pay for my light bill tomorrow? Right. Right. Uh, we're all good at that and we take it for granted. Yeah. And so a lot of times just sitting down with the rescue, I mean, that's how Carol and I started. I said, what do you need help with? Yeah. And she was like, I don't understand Facebook. <laughs> okay. She still doesn't. That, that, that right. <laughs> But that's an easy start. Right. Like, that's something I know. Yeah. Well, just like, you know, like as a business owner, you know, when you're in it, your world's this big. Right. And you can't see outside of that. So having that community that's looking in and isn't in the shit with you makes it so much easier to come to a solution. Well, and the rescues get in that same Correct. mentality, where but they don't want to support each other. <laughs> well, and they're so caught into what they're doing. Right. That they don't get the time. You know, it's right. um, so that's what we need to do. We need to do a um, a rescue symposium hosted by real estate pet project and spotted dog and modern canine solutions and just bring a bunch of rescue CEOs together. And how can we help you all? Well, and we've chatted with, you know, we chatted with Marnie Russ from, uh, kitten college, which is the coolest, um, uh, foster program I've ever seen. Yeah. Um, we, we chatted with, um, the folks up in Holland, Michigan that do, Trap, they do, they call it RTF, return to farm okay. for cats. And here's why. This is really interesting. So they started to do trap, neuter, release, right? Well, 
Michigan doesn't allow you as a rescue to release an animal. Mm. So once you trap, you can't release it. Right. So they started return to farm because what most people don't realize. So if you, let's say you have three acres and you have a wild cat on your acreage, keep that cat. Because if you remove that cat, the food source didn't go. Mm. So you're going to have two or three. Right. That come. So that's why a lot of times we'll sell houses and it's like, okay, can yep. we keep the barn cats? Right. Or we couldn't take them if we wanted to. Right. Right. Um, you want those cats there. You, you know, you want to make sure they're neutered. So you right. don't end up with a hundred of them. Uh, yeah. I mean, well, I got four. Yeah. <laughs> and they just increment. watching, this is the man who told me I would never have a cat. I, 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 I don't have cats. My wife has cats. You, I have, I, I've seen the pictures. You have I cats. have one cat. <laughs> he jumped in my truck at the gas station and came home with me. My last one I found in the middle of the street and I went to grab her. She ran into the wheel well of a car. I reached in, she bit onto my thumb and I pulled her out like pulled this. Out <laughs> Fishing for cats. <laughs> Walked her all the way to my car, biting on me. She's still the same way. Yeah. Mean as hell. <laughs> so yeah, this, I, I do. There you go. So yeah, we have four cats. They're all outdoors now, now that it's stopped winter. Um, See, all of ours are inside. I think, I think also there's also on. this, you know, I live on a farm though. Versus That's different. Land. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we see that a lot when people want to be involved in rescue, you know, the amount of dogs that get picked up from their own property yeah. by people who are trying to do the right thing. Right. Is kind of amazing. Yeah. Um, because we see that all the time. Oh, there's this dog in this field. I'm like, X. Yeah. It's his field. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know? There's let this big white let dog. him be. There's this big white dog and it's just hanging out with sheep. Yep. He, th he, he thinks he's a sheep. That's what he does. That's his job. Um, you know, and I think that rescuers definitely get a little overzealous at times. Yeah, right. I agree. Like, well, it's all emotional a, for them. Well, and there's a value to barn cats. Yeah. That that unless you have a barn, you don't understand. Right. You know, if you didn't have those cats, you would have a crap load of rats. Oh yeah. Or mice or whatever. Especially in our Quonset hut. Oh yeah. Quonset, the Quonset, <laughs> you know, but really, yeah, you well, I mean, that's our storage. I mean, the mice will eat everything in there. Well, that was why Carol had the cat. Right. Right. I don't want to get no cat. Too bad she can't put him in the barn with the dogs because right. the cats wouldn't live, <laughs> <laughs> but it but would they, take care of the mice problem. But they keep them out of the, uh, out of the, the garage and the food pantry you know, and all that kind of stuff. Which is all you need them for. Right. Cats are, cats are very useful on in agriculture people when they're realize. regulated huh when they're regulated right yeah that and that's the big thing yeah and almost anywhere in the country there's somebody who will help you do trap neuter release no yeah. right so there's no good reason for cats not to be neutered. if you have cats that are roaming your neighborhood call a rescue they'll know who does tnr right and you'll stop that problem for sure and You'll be down, you know, California is a little different because there's like legit community run cat communities. Yeah. Right. Um, but they're all neutered. Right. So, so you're not going to have that problem six years from now. You're going right. to have two cats, four right. cats, and I'm going to have 78. Right. As they age for sure. You know? So how can people get a hold of you? It's really easy. Spotteddoggroup.com is the website. My cell is 314-210-6540. You're always welcome to reach out either through phone call or text. Um, again, I work primarily St. Louis Metro and the rural areas surrounding St. Louis. So we go all the way up to Hannibal, all the way down to Ironton, Poplar Bluff. And then Joanna covers South Florida. So she's in Lauderdale, but she covers Miami. She covers um, Jupiter, all of that area. So when I get my rental property down in Florida, I have to call her. I've got one for you right now. I'm not ready. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. I've got one. She's got one that's really cute. And, you know, down there, it's a whole different animal because there's so many pet regulations yeah. with, with the individual communities. Right. And that's why they have such a problem at, at Justin Bartlett is there's, like, if a dog's over 20 pounds, you might have 10% of the houses they can go into. Mm. Like, even the HOA has a dog, has a limit either on right. the number. Most of them have, have weight limits. <laughs> You know, crazy. Cool. Awesome.